Hi guys, can I get a sound check? We can hear you. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Are you guys able to access the slide decks? I think it's in um, it's on Canvas in the yes. modules. Yes, we're able to access them. Okay, great. Next. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, guys, um, I think we can get started. Um, so I'm going through the slide deck one, and hopefully this format will work out with you guys. Uh, I have slides and then I'm gonna annotate them during the class. And then um, I hope hopefully you guys are getting the, the YouTube recorded YouTube videos also, and I'll put the annotated slides also up hopefully right after the class, not hopefully I will. Uh, okay, so let's get started. You know, the first thing I um, want to do is to basically, you know, the first couple of lectures are um, introducing you guys to the concept of semiconductors. You know, we kind of talked about semiconductors at a real high level, you know, the last lecture, you know, how, why they're important, those kind of things, you know, what it looks like to make them, etc. And now, so we're talking about um how you know um uh, is uh oops sorry guys um how you know how they work and and how we can use them um okay so the first thing we're going to talk about is basics of semiconductors then from the first type of device that we'll make from a semiconductor will be something called a diode and that's sort of synonymous with a PN junction as the same thing as a diode. So this is the same thing as a diode. And um, the symbol for a diode is this. You'll, you'll be seeing it a lot for the rest of your electrical engineering lives. And, um, you know, it has some interesting properties that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, one of the main so one of the things I wanted to mention about you know I, I think I mentioned this the last time um, we talked so you guys are probably familiar only so far with resistors and capacitors and maybe inductors I guess but so one of the properties of both of those is that they're kind of symmetric. So if you guys think about a resistor, so you know voltage is equal to current times resistance. That's the equation for a resistor. And if you plot that, 
in a voltage versus current curve. Yeah, by the way, we'll see like this, you know, voltage versus current curves a lot in this class. So it'll be something that we'll be seeing a lot. But if you if you plot this V is equal to IR, um, if you go this way, you know, this will just have a slope of one over R. It'll have a slope, right? And then if you go in the negative voltage, they'll have also the same slope. So it's symmetric, basically, um, for a resistor. The capacitor is more something that sort of uh, works with, uh, you know, putting charge in on a, on a um, capacitor. So Q is equal to, the equation will be Q is equal to CV. Uh, that's more of a, uh, you know, V is uh, Q over C. So if you want to change in voltage with charge, also you have, um, let's see, it's also symmetric. You know, if you if, if I plot voltage versus charge, um, if I put positive charge, you know, on this node here, you'll get a positive voltage or negative voltage, whichever way I want to look at it. But, and if I go the other way, it goes the other way. Okay, so it's basically symmetric. No matter how you flip these these two components, it's the same. Now, one thing that we're going to be getting into in this class is, are these nonlinear devices. So, for example, a diode, as we'll see in a in a few lectures, or just a sort of like a hint of what's to come, is something that sort of conducts in one direction. So if I have voltage versus current, once I get past a certain threshold voltage, it's like an on switch. It has like very low resistance here. So if you, if you think about this as having a slope one over R, essentially R is you know close to zero. So this slope ends up being like almost you know, an infinite slope. So very low resistance here. And then it's an off switch, anything below this threshold voltage. So you can see how this is different fundamentally, this, this new device that we're making with these semiconductors is fundamentally different than these previous devices you guys have seen. And, you know, when we, the diodes is what we'll start from, but then we'll get into transistors who even have a more complex behavior. Um, but it turns out you can use these complex behaviors to build lots of lots of interesting things. So you know all the the not necessarily dies, but with transistors, like we mentioned, you know all the stuff that works in your computer and cell phone, et cetera, is all made with these nonlinear devices that have you know, lots of interesting properties because they're nonlinear. Um, and you know, you'd have a hard time having making computational elements or anything really with just resistors and capacitors. But anyway, so that's sort of what's coming. So first we'll look at um, semiconductors and you know, how they, what they are, how they work. So if you look at the periodic table, um, you know, the semiconductors typically end up being in this group four. And the main one, sort of things started from, so back in the day, I think the very first transistors were germanium. Um, and it's still used, you know, in here and there, germanium, uh, you're about silicon germanium, et cetera. That's where, you know, you still hear it being used a little bit. And then on the other side, you hear about carbon, sort of like in the form of silicon carbide or something like that being, you know, people are trying to get stuff. And that's really like, um, what do you call it? Science, um, science experiments, et cetera. So is it? In a question of silicon carbide someday. But the vast majority, I mean, like 99.999, like I don't know what percentage, is made semiconductor products are made from silicon. So this is the 
with a capital T H E, um, most popular, most uh, available, popular, used, most used semiconductor. Okay, so one interesting thing, so th th there is like the, the property that's interesting from this, um, one of the interesting things about this group four elements is that they have four valence electrons. Okay, so let's see, I wrote this down. So, uh, you know, a valence electron is an electron in the outermost shell of an atom. And that means all the chemical reactions that an atom has come from the interaction of these valence electrons with the valence electrons of other atoms. So all of, I guess all of chemistry is basically these outer shell valence electrons interacting each other with each other. And you know, all these guys like carbon, silicon, germanium, they have four valence electrons. And that, that ends up being pretty important, as you'll see. So these have you know, group four as four valence electrons. And you know, group five has these guys have um, five valence electrons. And group three have three valence electrons. All this is important information for, for what we're about to do. Okay, so what does this mean if you have um, four valence electrons? That means if you have a, a crystal, so if you put a bunch of silicon atoms together, um, then that's what you know, semiconductors are made out of or just basically a crystalline wafer or a piece of crystalline silicon. So if you put them um, next to each other, what happens is since each silicon atom has, you know, these four valence electrons, it bonds with four other silicon atoms and they have these covalent bonds. So basically, they share the two atoms sitting next to each other. They share each, other, each other's valence electrons. And since there are four valence electrons available, the silicon lattice, you know, they can sort of basically, it's, uh, it can bond to four adjacent silicon atoms. Okay. So that's what a silicon lattice looks like. Now, um, we're talking about, you know, semiconductors. There's something interesting about semiconductors compared to other types of materials. So let's let's think about other types of materials. So I talked about um, capacitors, and you know, the I guess the impo important element in a capacitor is a material that would be an, an electrical insulator meaning that they don't conduct at all, don't conduct electricity at all, you know, until they break down or something happens. But in a normal situation, they are never conductive. Okay, you can make a, con that's what this material um, in, a capacitor is made out of whether whatever it is that you know whether it's a ceramic or something like that it doesn't conduct so you can put charge on on these two top and bottom plates you don't have to worry about current flowing through the capacitor so it can be used to store charge so that's an insulator or you know i don't know like your your you know electrical wiring has a piece of um, Gore-Tex or a piece of plastic, whatever it is around it, which doesn't conduct. So that's an insulator. So you don't, you know, end up electrocuting yourself or, or shorting something out. So that's an insulator. Then like when you look at a resistor, it's made out of something called a conductor. And a conductor 
always conducts electricity. It conducts, I don't know if you can say it conducts charge, but basically as you know, it doesn't matter what happens, it's always you put you know voltage across a resistor, there's always a current going to flow across it. Okay, so semiconductors. Some of the stuff I'm saying about semiconductors, like this nonlinear behavior or what I'm about to say, may seem like it's like so what, but they'll like it's sort of fundamental to the way they work, interestingly. So semiconductors, as their name suggests, they, is that they conduct electricity under certain circumstances. Okay, they don't, they don't conduct electricity all the time. They conduct electricity only under certain cases. Um, so let's see, what does that mean? So, um, you know, the situation of these covalent bonds being stable in a semiconductor is strictly speaking only true if, if you're just looking at the entire lattice being like this. Strictly speaking, this is only true at zero degrees Kelvin, okay, which is minus 300 degrees Celsius. Okay, so with absolute zero temperature, these guys are, you know, in solid. There's nothing conducting in this piece of silicon. But as the temperature goes up, what happens is um, some electrons get enough energy to break away from their sort of stationary silicon atom. And they turn into a free electron that's sort of floating, that can float around in the semiconductor in the silicon. Because as soon as this electron gets away from this bond, there's nowhere, you know, it can't, it's, you, all the neighboring silicon atoms like this guy, this guy, these guys already have a, a fully completed bond. So they can't capture that electron. So that electron, as long as it doesn't find another um, sort of empty silicon valence bond, it's gonna just potentially float around the silicon lattice, sort of looking for some place to, to call home. But once it sort of cooks off, off of that atom, it's gonna start being free until it gets, you know, again, it finds another, um, another home for itself. And it ends up that um, the, the number of these free electrons isn't that big, even as you get up to like room temperature. So typically room temperature, and that's another concept you'll hear about in this class. Um, so typically that's, so this is kind of a term of art. So don't think of the te actual temperature room you're sitting in. So this is usually 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. So it would be at, um, anyway, so that's, that's what you'll be sitting in. Even there, there's not that many electrons as we'll see compared to the total number of atoms in a lattice, okay? So at, even, even though you have these free electrons, they are not, they're much smaller than the total number of atoms typically in a, in a regular silicon um, um, crystal lattice. Uh, any questions so far? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So only at zero degrees Kelvin is when basically all the bonds are together, like they're all stable? In a semiconductor, yeah. In a, yeah. Semiconductor? That's correct. And then if it, the temperature goes up, then some kind of room free, right? Sorry, can you say that again? And then as the temperature goes up, then you have free electrons, right? That's correct, right. And we'll see that there's an equation for this. So I'll jump ahead here. So this equation on top is a really complex equation shows you how that works in a piece of um, silicon. So I'm just jumping ahead. I'll get, I'll come back to this, but just to, just to Elizabeth, just to show you the, you know, 
what, what this looks like. So these are just, and N sub I is the number of free carriers in, a, in silicon in a cubic centimeter, essentially. And it's a function, you know, it's a complex function of temperature. So this, you know, this is T to the three halves. This temperature is one over T and an exponential. And then this is something called a Boltzmann constant. Okay, which is, you know, sort of a, one of those physics, physical constants. And this E sub G is something called the band gap of the semiconductor. I'm not gonna really get into this band gap concept because it's like, we're gonna be, um, they're gonna, it's going down this rabbit hole and, uh, you know, there's a lot to discover here, but just sort of accept the fact that this band gap is a, a value that's different from, for different types of semiconductors. So like, for example, silicon, the band gap is, energy is 1.12 electron volts. Um, but you know, like something like a, uh, a, um, a non-conductor uh, insulator has a pretty big band gap typically, and conductors have like really small band gaps. So anyway, um, so anyway, it looks like this sort of very complicated equation, but you see if I have put in zero here for this T, okay, for these Ts, this guy just goes to zero. And then it's, you know, sort of, it has this, this behavior. You know, I, I think of it as an exponential behavior, but it's sort of a pretty fast rise with temperature, but you're always sort of not that many free carriers sitting around. Does that, did that answer your question? Okay, yeah, that did. And then um, random question, but huh? what happens to the electrons if you go under zero degree Kelvin? Um, you can't go under zero degree Kelvin. Oh my God, almost, yeah, sorry. <laughs> almost, like, well, no, I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I'm actually not, a, you know, sort of, since, I, since my retirement, I have time for deep thoughts, but uh, yeah, I'm still struggling with the concept of zero Kelvin. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's like, basically you have, so I guess the definition of zero Kelvin is there is no movement of anything. And gotcha. so there's no, temperature and so so I guess all temperature comes from the movement of stuff rubbing off against each other and so once you freeze at zero kelvin there's no such thing as lower than that there we go yeah all right thank you sure um let's see so okay so um so that was you, that was usually easy. Okay, here comes another concept. Now this is unique to semiconductors and you're gonna have a hard time with this concept and it's called the concept of a hole. Okay, so, you know, electron, we've all heard of holes. Well, in this context, you probably haven't heard of, heard of. but so once an electron cooks off and you have this, um, you know, this, you have this bond. So you have this, this bond here, right? Where the electron used to be. So the electron from here cooked off and it, you know, went off somewhere, right? It's no longer around. So you have this empty bond here and that's called a hole. Now it turns out that holes can also move in a semiconductor lattice a silicon lattice, like an electron can, but the reason they can move is that, for example, imagine if there's this guy here, it's sitting adjacent to this bond. So this electron might just pop into here and this hole comes over here, okay? Or in, this, in the case of sort of our two drawings here, the hole has gone from here to this guy. Okay, and then it can jump from here to, basically then there's an empty place here. This, this guy is now two connections. Okay, so now there's a gap here. And then that guy can move, um, you know, over to this adjacent guy and so on and so forth. So it can move as if it's a positively charged carrier. Okay, now this is not like antimatter. This isn't, 
a positron or something like that. It's just the mere fact that in a silicon, in a, in a crystal lattice or in a semiconductor lattice, let's, let's just call it a silicon lattice, when a crystalline lattice, when the silicon goes off, breaks its valence bond, you end up with sort of a free valence bond there. And that free valence bond can kind of move around as well. And the reason why it's positive, you can think of it as being positively charged, because in that particular really small region of space, there is you know, lack of an electron. So you end up with a positive charge. I don't know, maybe you want to think of it as like a bubble in a, in a water that's kind of floating around and the bubble really represents, you can think of it, I guess, as representing the lack of water in that, in that spherical thing that's floating around in your water. But so that's a hole. So basically what happens is when an electron cooks off, you get a free electron, which is negatively charged. It's going to be conducting as if it's a negatively charged, you know, it's basically a negative charge is moving around the, your lattice. And then you also end up with this thing called the hole, which looks like a positive charge floating there around the lattice. And so that they are always, they're called electron hole pairs because, you know, as soon as you sort of create an electron, you also get a hole in a, in a silicon lattice, okay? And some other circumstances, which we'll come to, you'll see that, um, that um, they can, uh, we can sort of create, we can actually sort of inject more holes or inject more electrons, depending on how we build our circuit. But again, it's holes are electrons, free electrons are negatively charged particles. You guys are familiar with that. And holes are positively charged particles. And again, they're not like some new, new material or whatever. It's just really an artifact of, of having a crystal lattice and, a, and an empty valence bond. So don't get too wrapped around the axle. It's, I know it's, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about deep thoughts about holes when I was taking this class for semiconductor physics. And just think of it as a positively charged free carrier and, and sort of move on as my suggestion for this class. Um, any questions about that? I guess momentarily, if you have questions about holes, I could try to answer them, but. Question. Uh, yeah. So does that mean that holes move at the same speed of electrons? Ah, good question. Not quite. It does, no, and as you'll see, it doesn't. They have, there's this thing called mobility, which is, you know, how fast these guys could move. And it turns out an electron in silicon, an electron has about two and a half to three times the mo mobility of a hole. So it can move about two and a half to three times as fast as a hole in silicon. Any other questions? Did that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Is there ever a point where there's just like too many holes or like will the silicone just kind of always be together and just move in and groove in? <laughs> uh, you know, there, there is a situation where as you'll see, you can create, yes. In fact, we'll, we'll be like intentionally creating an excessive number of holes or an excessive number of electrons. Um, so that's that's coming in a couple of slides, as a matter of fact. So there's, there are those situations. All right. And that's, that's how you kind of start actually getting some of these devices. Okay, guys, so, so we defined those two concepts. So again, I think the key concepts from those slides to take away is that in a semiconductor, and I'm, Going forward in this class, I'm kind of going to use silicon and semiconductor sort of synonymously. I think we're only going to be talking about silicon. So just think about silicon for the sex. Whenever I see semiconductor, think silicon, vice versa. So in a piece of silicon, um, we have uh, it's a semiconductor. That means it's only there's only certain 
amount of conducting elements in a semiconductor is another way to look at it. So let's say if you're at 30 degrees Celsius and you have a piece of silicon, there's only a certain number of electrons and a certain number of holes that are floating around in it that can conduct at a particular temperature. So when it's defined by this, um, by this equation, I'm not sure how talk about here. This is defined by this equation. Okay, so, um, and what else do I want to say about this? So, and you know, it's a complex, you know, complex equation. One thing I would suggest you guys do remember, um, sort of um, for this class and then going forward, assuming you guys are going to be doing working on semiconductors, et cetera, or maybe just for this class, I don't know. I, it's something I've remembered um, is, you know, I don't remember this, I, mean, I don't remember this equation. If you asked me to like replicate this equation without looking at it, I wouldn't be able to. But I remember that at, you know, 300 degrees Kelvin, the, the number of the intrinsic carrier concentration is 1.08, or you can think of it as 1.1 times 10 to the 10th electrons per centimeter cubed. Okay, that's a number that I kind of remember. Okay. And so, you know, another thing, I don't, I don't remember this number at 600 Kelvin, but it's interesting that you see how much that that number is so much bigger. It's um, almost not quite, it's like 100,000 times bigger than this number, right? It's five orders of magnitude difference between those two numbers, between this guy and this guy. So as the temperature goes up, the number of um, carriers goes up. Okay, so that's that. The other one that I that I, I think you guys probably already know, but it's another useful thing to remember is that the charge of an electron is one point is negative 1.6 times to the minus 19. There you go. Okay, so I I skillfully changed my story here a little bit in this slide. So I call this you know started by calling it the density of free electrons, but then I referred to it at some point as intrinsic carrier concentration. So let's see what, why, you know, let's see what, there's a reason I did that is because now going back to what Elizabeth was asking about, sort of, and we'll see, we'll be, uh, we'll be moving in that direction. If you wanna have more electrons than that, let's say I wanna have a situation where, okay, this is a piece of silicon, pure, pure silicon. Right, there is only silicon in this in this crystal. There's pure, absolutely pure silicon. Let's say I'm not happy with the number of free electrons I can get at room temperature. I want more electrons. What can I do? Well, so you can do this process called doping. And so, what does that mean? Now, remember when we um, looked at the periodic table. Um, I said that you know this information will come in handy that group four elements, which silicon is part of, have four valence electrons. And then adjacent to them, group five elements have five valence electrons. And group three elements have three valence electrons. Okay. Now, so what people started to doing is, well, maybe we can throw in some basically like dope or I don't know, flavor, I don't know what you want to call it, but let's put in some group five elements. So in this case, phosphorus is a particularly uh, common one. Both phosphorus and arsenic are popular, but let's say phosphorus, and into a silicon lattice and see what happens. So 
If you do that, and the way they actually do it is through a, a process called ion implantation. So, you know, if you guys were watching the video last on Tuesday where they were looking at these silicon wafers being processed, and a lot of the st steps involve this thing called ion implantation. And what they, in that process, what they do is the machine creates an ion of some type, either phosphorus, arsenic, boron, whatever. And then it, it just like shoots it like a cannon at really high energy into your silicon wafer. So you're just implanting, you're doping your silicon wafer with a bunch of these phosphorus atoms. So you can, you're basically introducing these group in this case, you're introducing this group five element in, into your silicon lattice. There's still, if you look at the ratio, there's still very few of these compared to all the silicon atoms. So this might be, you know, let's say, let's say, um, I may be remembering this wrong, but let's say a, a centimeter cubed of silicon has something like 10 to the 22 atoms. Okay, so typical numbers that you would add in terms of phosphorus or arsenic or boron might be, you know, one times 10 to the 12 to one times 10 to the 15, one times 10 to the 18, something like that, uh, which is, it is like, these are really big numbers, but, you know, compared to the total number of atoms, so these are all per centimeter cubed. So these are all per centimeter cubed, per centimeter cubed. So, you know, it's still 10 orders of magnitude less or, you know, seven orders. So 10 orders of magnitude means I've got, I don't even know what that is in terms of, that's like one ten billionth. So every, like this number, if you did, if you had this as a doping concentration, as is, which is, you know, some, you know, used often, that means every, like, if I'm not incorrect, every 10, for every 10 billion silicon atoms, you've put in one phosphorus atom. Okay, so it's not like, it's like, a, it's not a phosphorus lattice now that you have the same number of phosphorus atoms as silicon, but you've introduced, it's kind of like putting, I don't know, a little bit of milk in your coffee or something. Um, so it's not like a latte, it's, you know, like a, whatever, I don't know, I don't know what the analogy would be. So don't think of it, think of it as a few of these dopant elements in still a majority silicon lattice. Okay, so. What happens then? Let's say so you have this phosphor, phosphorus atom here now. So it turns out, you know, as we said, so phosphorus has, so phosphorus has five valence electrons, and silicon has four valence electrons. So even if, even if you're at, you know, whatever low temperature or whatever you're at. This phosphorus sitting here in a silicon um, uh, lattice always has this electron that has got nobody to bond to. Okay, so that guy is basically always available to move around the lattice. Okay, so basically, if I want more electrons, say at room temperature, that I would get in an all silicon lattice. If I throw in some phosphorus atoms in that silicon lattice, for every phosphorus atom I put in, I get one extra electron compared to what I would do if it was pure silicon. So, you know, the number, so pure silicon, the, this Ni is what's called the intrinsic carrier concentration or electron concentration because it's like pure for pure silicon. Okay, but if you dope the silicon with this group five elements, you actually get a number higher than that. 
and you basically get the this additional number thrown on top of the intrinsic carrier concentration. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, I guess maybe N stands for negative. I don't really know historically. Um, when you dope a piece of silicon with a group five element, meaning that you have extra electrons there, it's called an n-type material. So n-type means extra electrons. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so you can do the same thing now with the, or the reverse of this by putting in group three elements. So a group three element like boron has three valence electrons. And then again, group silicon has four, I believe, four valence electrons. So when you have this guy doped with something from group three, then you have an extra hole, no matter what, because it only has three bonds. It's always going to be, sorry, one, two, three. It's always going to be missing a bond. So for each boron atom you put into your silicon, you get an extra hole. Okay, so regardless of what it is. So you can get a pre predominantly whole uh, rich piece of silicon. And that's called P-type. So that means they're excess. Okay, so if you get a piece of silicon, you inject or dope the silicon with group five elements you get an excessive amount of electrons compared to what you normally would have, and you call it an n-type material. And if you dope it with group three elements, you end up with an excessive number of holes, and you call it a p-type material. Any questions about that, guys? Well, I guess that was the next slide here. I think I have a question on that. Sure. So, if you were to add boron, holes would be created. And then as you increase the temperature, more holes would also be created? Yes. Theoretically? Okay. Yep. Okay. So those are the two, two mechanisms for it. Okay. Well, that's all. OK. Thank you. Sure. OK. So. This, you're going to have to, I guess most of the stuff that I'm telling you guys take it at, at, uh, on faith. So here's another one that you're going to take on faith. But like this is like, again, getting deep into the semiconductor space. But there is this equation that says no matter what you do, okay? So again, no matter what you do, if you have the total number of electrons, times the total number of holes in a piece of semiconductor, it always equals, equals to the intrinsic carrier constant concentration squared. No matter what you do. Okay, so remember, so let's say we're talking about 300 degree Kelvin. Okay, so at that point, Ni is 1.08 times 10 to the 10th electrons per centimeter cubed. Or let's say just say call it carriers per centimeter cubed. Okay, so Ni squared is roughly 1.1 times 10 to the 20th um, carriers squared per centimeter to the sixth, I guess. Okay, so this number, no matter what you do, if you take all the electrons times all the holes, like you dope it, you don't dope it, whatever it is, it always equals 
to this, okay? It makes sense why you would do it when there's no dopants, right? When there are no dopants, we said, or I said, that the number of electrons is the same as the number of holes, right? So when there's no extra dopants, you have purely a silicon lattice. For every electron that's created, there is a corresponding hole created. So if the number of electrons is n sub i, then the number of holes will also be n sub i, and this equation makes sense. But it turns out that even if you increase that number of the, by, by injecting group five or group three elements, this equation will still hold regardless, okay? So this, this is like a key equation that you should just, you know, we're just gonna ask you to accept. So, okay, now what happens when, so another definition, so we had, um, we said um, group five, sorry, group, let's call it group three, okay? If you dope a material with group three, um, we call that a P-type silicon. Again, I'm using silicon and semiconductor synonymously because we're only dealing with silicon, but you'd have a P-type, you could have P-type germanium too, whatever. And the, the, those, those dopants are gonna be called acceptors. So those, these are the phosphorus atoms. They're also referred to as acceptors. Don't ask me why there's so many different names for sort of stuff that's more or less the same, but I guess they're slightly different. So the silic, the, the phosphorus or arsenic, uh, no, no, sorry, these are boron. Sorry, group three is boron. Sorry, guys. So the bar, the borons are, where is that? So that is a boron. So once the boron atoms, they get injected in the silicon, they're not called acceptors and their density is sort of referred to as capital N sub A. So this is the density of acceptors. All these densities are per centimeter cubed. Okay, so what else can I write? So now if I had a group five, then it would be, what am I calling this thing? This would be P-type. So that gives me N-type silicon because I'll have more electrons. And those are called donors and they're referred to as, so donors. So let's say this could be either a phosphorus or a arsenic. And those are, their densities referred to as N sub D. Okay, so let's say we have, so let's say I have a piece of silicon. And I just put in a bunch of boron atoms, right? Put them in here. So that becomes a P-type piece of silicon just that part of the silicon, this area. It's called a P-type silicon. And the density of these boron atoms in here is N sub A. So it could be, you know, again, it could be 10 to the 12 per centimeter cubed. It's kind of those kind of numbers typically, 10 to the 15, 
those kind of numbers. Okay. So when you have that many in um, in a piece of semiconductor, remember the intrinsic um, acceptor. So let's say this is um, n sub a, right? This is um, how many um, boron atoms I have, and every one of these boron atoms has is going to introduce its own hole, right? So if I have ten to the twelve centimeter per centimeter cube of boron atoms, I'm going to have an additional ten to the twelve holes per. And my, my handwriting is getting worse every day. Holes per centimeter cube. Or I might have an additional 10 to the 15 holes per centimeter cube. And I remember that when I had, you know, like a bare piece of silicon, I would only, again, this is all at room temperature at like whatever, 300K or whatever. So I would only have 10 to the 10th holes per centimeter cube. That's sort of my intrinsic hole concentration. Okay, in either case, it'd be 10 to the 10th. So for example, in this case, I would have a hundred times more holes in this case when I doped it by one times 10 to 12 boron atoms, I would have a hundred times more holes than I would have in a bare piece of silicon for the same temperature. Here I would have a hundred thousand times more holes. Okay, so in this piece of silicon, basically the number of as soon as I dope something, piece of silicon the number of holes more at, at typically ends up being the same as the number of acceptors, so for p-type. So I guess this goes to Elizabeth's question that you can get like a lot of holes in a piece of silicon. You basically, that's what you're doing is you're implanting it with these acceptors and you're basically forced, you know, you're creating a lot more holes if you if you dope it with acceptors than you normally would. Okay. Now remember that p times n always has to equal to n i squared. Always. So I just have to take this at face value. This is you know God given whatever. So if I say that p is equal to n sub a that n has to equal to n sub i squared over n sub a. So why is this useful? You'll see why this is useful. But what, what in practice happens is that as an engineer or the engineer who made this piece of silicon knows how many, um, what how much, sort of of these boron atoms he injected, he put into this piece of silicon. So he can, he can tell you that. And then because of this equation, you can calculate how much you know, holes we have in that piece of silicon now and how much electrons, okay? The electrons just ends up being the Ni squared over N sub A. Can you Does say that, that last sense? part one more time? Sure, because of this equation, which is P times N is equal to Ni squared. Okay, if you have P as N sub, so if P is N, N sub A, then N has to be Ni squared over N sub A. Because of this, you just plug in N sub A into this P and then you put it on the other side. Does that make sense, Brandon? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, does, does, that, does that make sense, guys? Yeah, so if you like to scroll up to the last slide. This one? 
Yeah, that one. So is huh? that wrong? Or no, this is it would be so what I'm talking about is here. Did I say something wrong? Oh no, you never wait. What's so doesn't I thought majority carriers meant no wait, never mind. No, actually you're 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 on the right track, Jonathan. Um so I, I was gonna I was gonna leave that to keep you guys from getting too confused. So give me a second, I'll come back to your question. But but you're making a good point. I left that for um for till I give you guys the corresponding case. So we just talked about what if you dope a piece of silicon with extra group three elements. Now you could do the same thing with take a piece of silicon and you can put in extra group five elements. So let's say phosphorus. Good. Put implant phosphorus in here and you would get sort of these, these the density of these phosphorus elements. Remember the group five elements are donors and that's the, their concentration would now be called N sub D, which is the donor concentration in one over centimeter cube. And you might be putting in something again, one times 10 to the 12 per centimeter cubed, one times 10 to the 15th per centimeter cubed, maybe more, maybe less, but those are the kind of numbers. And so now, in this case, you still have the same thing where the number of free carriers, again, if you're talking about 300 degree Kelvin, is around you know, 1.1 times 10 to the 10th. And now in these cases, you have, when, when you dope this thing with donors, you end up having 100 times more electrons than you had initially, or 100,000 times more electrons than you had initially. So in, and this is now called the N-type silicon, because you put in these, these group four, five elements, which are also called donors. So now this has an excessive amount of electrons. And because that excessive number is Typically, you know, 100 times, 1,000 times, 100 times, 100,000 times more in that piece of silicon than normally would be there. Now, the number of electrons, oops, sorry, the number of electrons here ends up being approximately the number of donors in M-type silicon. Oops. Okay, and so we still have the same equation holds, and so P is an I squared. So in this case, P, the number of holds, ends up being an I squared over N sub D. So I did everything the same, except you know, in one case, we had a P-type silicon, which has acceptors or group three elements in it. And the other case I have, um, and type silicon, which has group five or um, donors in it. Okay. So, um, you guys are all with me? I'll, I'll take I'll take that as a yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's again confusing. I have more definitions. I don't know why they have so many different definitions, but you kind of get used to it. Okay, so so this is I think Jonathan was asking this question about majority carrier versus minority carriers. So depending on whether you're in a p-type material or an n-type material, either an electron or a hole would be considered the majority carrier, and the other one would be called a minority carrier. So if you're in a p-type material, there you have an excess amount of holes compared to electrons. 
So the holes would be called a majority carrier. So in p-type silicon, holes are in the majority. So, you know, there might be like a hundred times, a thousand times, a hundred times, a hundred thousand times more holes than there are electrons. So they'd be called majority carriers. Right. Sorry, guys. Sorry for my handwriting, but I just, there's nothing to be done about it. Um, and then electrons are in the minority. Because also look at this equation, right? Because Pn is equal to Ni squared. So in a piece of silicon that's not doped with anything, you have the same number of electrons and holes, neither one is majority, and the two of them multi, you know, give, it gives you this number. At, again, at 300 degrees Kelvin, it's 1.1 times 10 to 22. If I'm forcing, the number of holes to be higher than n sub i, I'm actually making the number of electrons lower than n sub i. So, you know, the, the usually when you're talking about something being a majority carrier, like the holes being a majority carrier in a piece of p-type silicon, there's usually like a lot, lot more holes than there are electrons. There's like thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions more holes than there are electrons. And so they're usually a strong majority. Again, depends on how much you dope it, et cetera. So now that the confusing part is, well, when you have a N-type silicon, oops, now you're forcing the electrons to be majority carriers. And that means that the holes, oops, holes are minority carriers. And so this, this slide, you know, again, going back to this guy, it summarizes it, is in a, so this is for a, um, so this is for a P type. Silicon. This is for a n-type silicon. So in a p-type silicon, what you did was you doped it with uh, acceptors or group three elements, and you made the number of holes in this piece of silicon the same. Give you're going to have the same density of holes essentially as how much you extra atoms you put in, and then you reduce the density of electrons by, by the sort of this ratio of this equation. Okay, so and then you make the holes the majority carrier and you made the electrons the minority carrier and vice versa. An n-type silicon, you, you added group five elements, otherwise known as donors, and you made the electrons a majority carrier and you reduced the number of holes and made them minority carriers. Everybody good? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, so now we're we're going to Elvis's question. So about the speed, the velocity of these things. Do they move? Um, do, they, do they move at the same um, rate? And it, the answer is they don't, okay? So when you, um, no, so that's, let's, let me, so let's, let me describe the slide to you guys. So let's say I put a battery or a voltage difference across a piece of, Silicon. Okay. So what happens is this voltage gives rise to an electric field. Okay. So the equation for that is 
E, the electric field is negative of the change in potential over X, which is the distance. Okay, so this is some voltage. So the negative means if I have a positive voltage here, negative voltage here, my electric field actually is going from positive to negative. Okay, so that's what this, this negative means. Okay, so once I have an electric field, okay, if you guys remember a charge in an electric field is basically, you know, it's got a force on it. So it's gonna basically move in the direction that that electric field tells it to, okay? So because a electron has negative charge, it's gonna go opposed to this electric field. So if there's a, you know, if there's an electron here, it sees this electric field pointed uniquely in this direction. So this is a very directional electric field. So because it's, it's uniformly higher potential here than it is here, you're gonna get theoretically, I guess it's not really true, but for the sake of discussion, let's say you get a uniform electric field inside the semiconductor. So any electrons here would start, the electric field is gonna force them to move in this direction. Okay, and then correspondingly, if you have any holes floating around here, because they're positively charged, the electric field is going to make them move in this direction. Okay, and so, so that's <clears throat> the, the, as soon as you put a voltage across this piece of silicon, you're going to get an electric field, and that electric field is basically going to make any mobile charges, which are electrons and holes, to move either in the direction of the electric field or in the direction opposite the electric field. And then they'll have a certain velocity, which is dependent on the electric field. And so this equation for the velocity as a function of the electric field has this constant, this is called mobility. Oops, mu is called mobility. And mu sub p is the mobility of holes. And mu sub n is mobility of electrons. And all this mobility is, it's the proportionality constant between the electric field and the velocity of the charges that are moving because of the electric field. And so, as I mentioned before, I think Elvis was asking this question, the mobility of holes is about a factor of two and a half to three lower in silicon, depends on a bunch of things, but typically than electrons in a piece of silicon. So the holes move much slower than, than electrons do. Okay, and it's proportional to the electric field. Any questions? Okay, so this move, this type of movement is called drift. As we'll see, there's two types of movement of mobile charges in a piece of, in a piece of semiconductor or silicon. The first one is called a drift and it happens only when you have an electric field. Okay, so if you did, if I removed, if I removed this voltage and therefore I removed this electric field, there would be no electric field. So there would be no drift mechanism where preferentially electrons are moving in a certain direction and holes in another direction. That just wouldn't happen. Okay, so that's called drift. Now, um, <clears throat> I'll, I don't know if this is like important, but basically from this drift, you that is important, but I don't know how much I want to get into this. But from this drift, basically, you can get a calculated current flow. Okay, assuming you have 
a certain density of electrons or a certain de density of holes. You can geometrically figure out how much volume of charges you have and um, how, how fast you know, the charges would get from A to B and what that would mean in terms of a current, okay? So it turns out then the current is a function of this velocity times the cross section of, so W times H is the cross section of this area times the number, basically the density of charges times the, times the charge of an electron. So this is, I, let's just, that was just for your info, but it turns out that if you have this drift, so this is all kind of leading to this equation here, that if you have this, if you have an electric field across a piece of silicon produced by a voltage across it, you get basically a current. This is a current density. So this J sub N is taking this current, dividing it by the cross section. So basically it's sort of getting rid of this W and H term, making it more general. And basically it ends up being a function of, so this, this was velocity, this mu sub n times e, this is for the electrons, times n again, which is the density of electrons times the charge of an electron. Okay, so you get this current density. And then you get a correspondent um, whole current density. So you get an electron, um, you get an electron current and you get a whole current. So it turns out that the electron is, has a, you know, a negative charge, but then, you know, it's going in the opposite direction as a hole, but the hole has a positive charge. So it turns out that once you throw in all the signs, these two currents actually act together. So they're not subtracting from each other, but they're sort of helping each other get this current. So this is the current density you would get <coughs> because of this drift function. Any questions from that, about that? That's correct, you know, it's current density. So basically all it is is current divided by the width times the height of this piece of material that's going across. <coughs> so that's drift. Just as an aside, again, this is maybe more confusing than not. This business, so if I, you know, if I was going to plot this equation that velocity is mu sub n times e minus, or it's the velocity of electrons or velocity of holes is mu sub times e, implies that as electric field increases, my velocity just continuously goes up. But in fact, what happens is, so this, this curve of this electric field versus velocity doesn't always go up. It sort of saturates after a while because the electrons or holes are colliding with the lattice. So they start slowing down at higher electric fields. It's not really that important, but you know, this is just mentioned. So anyway, that's, that's drift current. So turns out, so that's one type of um, current transport mechanism. Then turns out there is a second type of current transport mechanism. They're both important as you'll see. And the second one is called diffusion. So again, drift is only if you have an electric field across a piece of silicon and you are preferentially moving, putting a force on electrons and holes to move in a certain direction. Diffusion is actually like a, uh, is doesn't even, the, the particles don't even have to be charged. It just comes from um, like a um, Brownian motion, okay, of, of stuff. So the best way to think about it is if you have a glass of water and you put a drop of ink in the glass of water and you wait long enough, so first, the, uh, the ink is just concentrated in the drop. And then 
as time goes on, what happens is the ink starts getting distributed more and more evenly until if you wait long enough, that ink drop gets uniformly distributed across your glass of water. And the reason for that is this diffusion mechanism. And again, it doesn't, it's a thermodynamic type of function. And basically it says that things that are free to move tend to go from places where they are more dense to where they're less dense until they uniformly take out of space. The other way to think about it is if you just take, you know, imagine if you had a, 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 a hollow chamber or whatever, and you put some gas in there, the gas, those gas molecules will just expand till they're uniform. They're not going to be sitting in some chunk of that, um, that uh, volume. They're going to expand out again, just purely from, from thermodynamics and Brownian motion until they are, have sort of disuniformly distributed themselves in that space. And so basically the same happens if you have a higher um, concentration of carriers in a semiconductor in one part of the semiconductor than another, what happens is those carriers will go from a place of high concentration to a place of low concentration. Again, they, don't, they, don't even, they wouldn't even have to be you get that mechanism whether they're charged or not, okay? And so that, um, that mechanism, because, but because they are charged, that mechanism of these carriers going from high concentration places to low concentration places, that's also sort of a something that has an aggregate movement. And because they're charged, it gives you an aggregate current. And that's a function of the difference in the concentration. And in that case, because there's no electric field and no negative dependence on an electric field, the total current concentration basically has the two currents for the hole and the electron are working in opposite to each other. So they reduce one from the other. Okay, so they're not adding like the drift current, the two drift currents were, they're actually reducing each other. Okay, so guys, I'm gonna stop right there for today. Any questions? No? I saw you posted something about the homework, about homework. Is that just gonna be like problems in the back of the book? Yeah, so if you, the homework isn't anything you hand in, but like I mentioned, I, I think for circuit design, I mean, for this class, you've got to do a lot of problem solving. So basically, um, those homework are just my answers to some of the questions in the, in the book, in the back of each chapter, in this case, chapter two. And... I, I would suggest you guys go through, try to work them out, and the answers are there. But you don't have to hand them, you know, like you don't hand them in or anything. But um, so, anybody else? Nope. Oh, I had a couple questions. Sure. Um. So. I guess like my one of my main questions would be like in what scenario would you want more holes and would you want more electrons to do specific things? Um, that's that's coming. So to me, okay. well, like well, I can I can jump ahead actually. Remember, I I talked about first. Let me jump all the way to the back. <clears throat> so 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 far in this. In this lecture, we're talking about semiconductors generally. And then this device that we'll be talking about, the first one, which is this diode with this non, you know, this, this first usable device, actually is basically a high, you know, a P-type material right next to an N-type material. And so basically you dope one type full of holes, the other one full of electrons. And that has some 
you know, useful properties like this type of property where you have this kind of a switch function or nonlinear function. Okay, all right. Yeah, and transistors are made in the same way. They're like basically N-type and P-type material sitting next to each other and in interacting in some, in some ways. Okay, that makes sense. And then I had one other one. Um, can you go over again what, um, sorry, I think it's I-N or no, N-I is? Yeah. Oh, so that, so N-I is basically, if is, is called the intrinsic carrier concentration or the concentrations of electrons or holes in a piece of semiconductor if there is no external dopants. Okay, okay. So, so basically if we didn't add any phosphorus, any arsenic, any boron, whatever, at a particular temperature, at a particular temperature, you would have a certain number of carriers and that's called N sub I. Okay. Can you say the name for it one more time? It's intrinsic and- Carrier concentration. Not so intrinsic nope. carrier concentration. So, you know, all these things have like different names and different things that are, it gets really confusing. So intrinsic is, um, so when you add dopants to material, so let's say you have a piece of silicon um, when, it has dopants added to it, they call that extrinsic carrier because they have brought in some extrinsic things into the silicon. So intrinsic here means, um, something like this is a translator, it means pure silicon. The reason it's called carrier is because when you're in an intrinsic state is the number of electrons is the same as the number of holes. So for example, this says N sub I is electrons per centimeter cubed, but when you don't have any external dopants, the number of holes is the same as the number of electrons. Okay, so that's why I call it carrier and sort of in semiconductor physics, you call it carrier and concentration just because you're giving it per unit volume. And the carrier would, would be the holes and the electrons? Yeah, so in the case okay. where you're intrinsic, the carriers would be holes and electrons and you have exactly the same number of holes as you would have in electrons. Okay. Right. So this formula is basically with no doping? This is with no, no doping, yep. Holes equal. And then this is, well, this would be N sub I, right? Is always holes, but then if you actually wanna know the carrier concentrations when you have doping, is use these formulas. Anything else, guys? Okay, those guys have a good weekend, and I'll um, I guess I'll talk to you guys on Tuesday. Take care. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. See you next week. Bye.